Oh, okay. So I was just saying that you want to go to the center early for your IA come Sunday the 21st. At the time and the specific venue you were given, those who do not know your way around main campus, please take note that there is a center, a computer lab outside of main campus. You see around Presec, there's UGBS, the University of Ghana Business School's computer lab, which is big and accessible to you, opposite Presec there. So if you don't know the place, get yourself acquainted with it so that on the day you don't miscalculate and enter into campus and think that is the UGBS, uh, UGC is near BAM library alone. That is a computer lab. You, you get there and then when they check, no, this is not the place you are assigned to. They have to do take a car outside of campus that can eat into the time allocated for you. So get, just get yourself accustomed to the assigned venue, you'll be fine. Let's see if I go ahead now. Thank you. Um, good morning, madam. Good morning, good morning, my dear. Please, I wanted to know, the IE, would it cover from like one to seven? Please come again. I didn't hear you. I said that the IE we are going to write on 21st. Is it going to cover from topic one to we'll cover topic everything seven? we have done? I just said that to Auntie. Everything. Okay. Yes. Thank everything. You. You're welcome. The thing is, you can't take some topics out. Which one are you going to take out? Because perhaps the one you don't want to include is the one that someone finds a bit more com comfortable easier to access, you see. We are dealing with 1,000, just uh, close to 1,500 students. How do you tell which topic is easier for person A and not for person B when we've done all, you see? So it will be from all the topics. There will be multiple choice questions and some short answer questions. The total mark that you will earn from the interim assessment, these are, are all, you know, stuff you know already. The total mark you will earn will be 30. Three to add to the critical summary you've done ten percent that would be forty, and then the in class assessments that we do all the time we will compute your ten percent from that. Then it will be fifty, and the final exam, which comes at the end of semester, that one you do S's five, uh, I say five fifty uh, percent. Okay, you go and write S's. I'm thinking of maybe one compulsory question and two others or two, you know, one worth 25%. If it's, there's a compulsory question plus another, it's possible that compulsory question could be 30 max, then the alternative one will be 20, you know, all of those possibilities. But your final exam will be essays. These are all on your course outline, yeah. So you put these together, it gives you the 100. Those who are crying their heads over, I don't know if it's crying over or getting worked up with the critical summaries. They were meant to help you learn. And I reward that effort with 10% for just one of the submissions. So someone will say, ah, then I did all the others. Yes, you did them, it will help you learn. I think I suffered to grade them, to show you that if we were marking what you have presented, this is how much you would have earned. Maybe your first attempt, you got six, the second one, you got nine, the third one, you got 10, or the first one, you got 10, the second one, you got nine, the third one, you got six. I'm talking about the critical summaries. It is the highest, is the highest that will count all the time. I'll pick only one, one of them, that's all, and record for you, okay? But then there's several attempts at doing those critical summaries. I'm helping you become better at the content for tomorrow, which is now today, you see. <laughs> so we, we are not going to record 40 because we did four critical summaries and each one of them, you got 10, 10, 10, 10. That doesn't mean you got 40. And the person who was not on the site or was there but missed the deadline or something like that, who did only two, will not get 20. It is the 10 that matters. The one that scores is 10, finished. Now, some of you, maybe someone didn't do any of the four. I won't be able to help. I mean, four different critical assessment, uh, critical reading, hmm? assessment. You should take anyone to earn a mark. You still didn't do it. This is the eighth week. What, what is the lecturer supposed to do about that? Here you see. 
So you cannot blame the lecture. I'm thinking that perhaps the last topic we have, which is, um, what's the thing? Uh, cultural identity. That's the last paper we have to read, if you like, and then discuss to complete the semester. We still have two weeks ahead. So we are well in time and we haven't rushed. We have mark time twice. This is a mark time we are doing to make sure that we have gathered everyone in and move on. I think two weeks or so ago, we did the same thing. I paused and then worked out what we've done. So you're feeling like that's why I think that I'm relatively a bit confident in this batch of students because of the push train of the class. And I think that it will show the performance. I hope that my expectations are not disappointed because I feel that you are very, very, generally speaking, that folks know the content. They know, they know, <laughs> they know the content. Even the questions sometimes asked either by email or in class or when we are interacting. It shows a competent class. Participation is very high, even in person or online. You would see that students are doing their best at it. So I want to say that if it goes the way it's going, then we'll have a very good, good performing class. Okay. Just to give you an assurance. But you still have to do your mopping up. And that is what I don't want you to miss. Mop up. Don't be overconfident. All right. So, sister, yes, yeah, that's the answer. And from topic one all the way to the last thing we've done under day card. The last we've done is day card. You would see that uh, there's so much to cover. We're doing multiple choice. There's so much to cover. What's the other question, please? I don't see any hand up, then we are recording. So it's, it's it, it will just be a blank. When you are playing back, it can be very frustrating if nothing is going on, you are just using data. So if I presume that there is no question, then God willing, I wish you all the best on Sunday. Get there early and write, concentrate on your own stuff because Okay, the, a word to the wise is enough. Richard, ask your question. Okay, Joseph Marfo, go ahead, Joseph. Madam, please, good morning. Good morning. Um, Madam, please, I wanted to ask um, on a question on the one of the explanation on the doubting sensory okay. knowledge of the oh, wait, Joseph, Just ask that question. What is the question? Ask it. The uh, the dream argument. That's the only thing I want done? to. What has it done? Um, but I, I I get a little bit confused about. Is it that when he? Uh huh. Go ahead. Say. But in that aspect, I don't really get it. But with the link. Uh, I want to. I want to know what you don't get. <laughs> okay, well, I don't think, let me let, let me start with the limitation on the census argument. For that one, how I understand it is that he means that when he, when an object is at a far distance, and the object, whenever he looks at the object, it, it can be a person coming or a car coming, but the object or the person coming is not what he thinks of. It could turn out to be false later. So what the sense is that. The sense of sight taught him could turn out to be false. That's why he doesn't okay. trust false, isn't it? Now, yes, yes. now, what has it got? What about the the, the uh, dream yes. argument? The dream argument yes. is going to do what? What does he use the dream argument to do? Um, it's just like uh, whenever he's what he's does, sleeping. What does and he, he use? Don't worry. What does he use the dream argument to do? Do you see that? What does Descartes use the dream argument to do? If you don't know that one, you understand the dream. Yes. You have to know what he's using it for. And it is like clearly that, right. Hmm? He's using a dream argument to doubt sensory knowledge. Every sensory knowledge? Not every sensory knowledge, please, madam. But which other one? Ah, uh, from yes. from his from his passage, he said that he doesn't need to um clarify uh, that all. Uh, uh, 
I'll give you Hanyang. I said, what does he use the dream argument to do? They said to doubt sensual knowledge. And as you see, every yeah. sensual knowledge that he needs a dream argument to doubt. That's what I'm asking. Can someone answer um, just for me? Because I'm sure he's speaking for many of you. So anyone wants to tell us or including Joseph, why they can't needed a dream argument. I've set your questions. So I am, I'm being mindful not to sound as if I'm giving you answers to questions I've set, but we still have okay. to uh, and, and, and give students clarity. So I'll guide you to content that has already been delivered. Today's own cannot be a lecture because you have an exam ahead, you see. It's like the way the end of the semester exam before you write it, we are giving a revision week, a week to revise. So you are revising, but I'm aiding you to revise. Can someone help us know why? Uh, the dream argument. Why we need a dream argument? Why Descartes needed the dream argument? Okay, but well, please let me say something. If only it's true, yeah. Hey, nobody knows it, friends, or you won't help your friend. Hey, a friend in need is a friend indeed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. Hey, move one. Don't, don't worry. Sorry, your hand is up. Please, please go ahead. Yes, madam. Madam, good morning. Good morning. I, please, I use the stream. He used the, the dream argument to that object that are close to him. That's Very close good. for. Very good. Object of sight, sensory knowledge, eh? object of hearing, yeah. object of touch, etc. But this time, not just all sensory knowledge, Joseph, but those that yes, are madam. close. You, you gave us a very good rendition of his first level of argumentation, the limitations of the senses. Our senses are limited yeah. when it comes to far and distant objects. I cannot know directly if I'm sitting in my office, what is happening at home. Okay. I'm limited. I may depend on what someone tells me, which can be false. I may, you see that? Yes. I mean, I, I won't even see my room. I'm in the office. Okay. How do I see what is happening? I'm not a witch. <laughs> even if I were a witch, I don't use my physical body to do that. I use some other part of me to do that. Uh -huh. So that is the first level of argumentation that if I want to trust a source that has such a limit, such a, a, a limitation, then it, it can't give me so much. It doesn't have the capacity to do some of the things I expect it to do. That's one. Then two, what about if the thing is not far away, but it's so close to me? Mm -hmm. How do I use the limitation of the senses argument to doubt it? It won't work because this is not like the mirage. Which is a pool of water ahead of me there, far away. This one there is a phone. I'm holding it right now. How can I doubt that I'm holding a phone? How can I doubt that I'm talking to Joseph Mafo and John Boyd, Boyd, who are just directly seated in front of me like this? <laughs> that is when Uncle Descartes needs what the dream argument to okay. cast doubt on what close and obvious okay. knowledge. Yeah. Sensory knowledge. It's still a doubt on sensory knowledge, but the, the one that is close to me, not far away, the one that is obvious. Obvious meaning that you shouldn't have subjected you to doubt that I'm sitting by by a table right now. He used uh, his own example, Descartes. He said that I'm holding a glass in my hand right now, sitting in front of a fireplace, rocking myself in a chair. How can I doubt that one? He said, well, I can doubt that also, you know, because in dreams too, when I'm dreaming too, things are so close like that. That's when I gave you all those funny examples in class. When you mm -hmm. say, you kiss the bride, the guy is kissing the bride in, in his dream. <laughs> it's so close, mm -hmm. most of not really say. <laughs> Only to wake up to realize that he's sleeping at the garage, there's some rat is passing by, maybe he was kissing the rat. Mm -hmm. rat. So you could, wake, <laughs> you could wake up to realize it was a dream. So he needed a dream argument to doubt what close and ob obvious I hope that is okay, sir. Yes, please, madam. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. It, it, that will be helpful to some of your colleagues. They, they just don't want to say it. For my mama, right. Right. <laughs> hey, Brad John. I get that. Okay. So is a, <laughs> John, is there a question you have? If not, I take. Please don't write Jupiter and things like that. How will I reward you? John, Ma, Joseph Mafu, I know you more. Perhaps not, I won't remember him outside of class, but if he's in class, I can make him out. He's the one who made me give away my answer. No, no, madam, there is no. <laughs> I think I'm. Yeah, but if you write Jupiter, yeah. 
Is Jupiter your, your main sign? How do I give you max? How do I even look if you come to the office and say, Doc, I'm not sure so, something didn't go. I think that is how would I even give you attention? You see, you have to know. Uh -huh. Okay, so last week I asked for Santoa because of how she read. Oh, I forgot her first name, but I still remember that she's a Santoa. There were two as Santos. That's how you get so you come for a recommendation or something. It's not difficult to identify. It. Not you come four years later and you're coming to say that, oh, doc, I was one of your students. Do you not know any students by the grace of God. I have turned out. Hey, thousands and thousands of you. Wow. Okay, Jupiter. Won't you know, Mama a bro? Change your name. I can't call you Jupiter unless it's your name or your. <laughs> Ask your question, Sister Jupiter or Brad Jupiter. <laughs> if you have a question, then we are good. Thank you. Let's take Jupiter. Yay, Jupiter. Jupiter, we talk again. <laughs> okay, any other question? If there's no question, let's end. Dear friends, don't impress yourself that you are in class. Okay, topic one, we, de we dealt with it. Topic two, those who are on the academic channel, you may want to play the uh, main campus folks' uh, recording and see if there is anything there. So you are writing the same paper. Bindola, is that your name? Is your name Bindola? Or it is your nickname? Go ahead. Because I, I know there's Creflo Dollar, so maybe your name is Dollar. Please go ahead, unmute first, and then ask your question. Yeah, there are some crying a man for. Time pana museni say I have work to do. <laughs> if you are okay, let's end so that you can go and polish up, maybe do some tutorials or read over your slides, play some play back your videos, you know, discuss amongst yourselves. Because when you have reached, it is you. It is more of you. That's why I'm not even adding the introduction. Like I said, I would have done for the other topic. I won't add it. So you have less worries. So you are thinking of what is philosophy, why study philosophy, you know, the approaches to doing philosophy, the tools or skills that philosophy trains you with. You do philosophical, when we say you do philosophy, you use conceptual analysis, you do uh, uh, question asking, you, you, you use the tool of uh, evaluation. All those ones are there. You get it. It's a question that is typically labeled as philosophical versus the one that is not philosophic. philosophical. It's a question that is not philosophical. Why Kwame Jechi defines philosophy the way he does? What, why it is important that you examine your life? What, these are only topic one, the branches of philosophy, questions that are correctly labeled as say, metaphysical versus the one that is epistemological. Um, what's the other one? Oh, I'm saying all these things off my head, you know, because I, I, I am studying, though I'm not going to write an exam. And I'm sure you two have covered some good ground there. Uh, uh, what philosophy is not and what it is. Okay, the scope, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we come to uh, topic two. Yes, Deborah. Deborah Lomote, go ahead. Debra, you raised your hand, though. That's why I called you. If the question is gone, then we continue. Then topic uh, topic two dealt with uh, Plato's world of forms. You see that? The world of forms, the world of appear appearance. It's allegory of the cave. His essentialism comes to play. The two ways he distinguishes what uh, between the two worlds. And why he thinks that the cave situation doesn't give us true knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that on Plato. Then we move to Ortega, topic three. We looked at Ortega, which was still a metaphysical question. We didn't delve into the free will determinism proper. We just did his theory of human nature, why he denies that human beings have a nature. Okay, and what he means by nature and the argument he pro pro profits for that. The uh, two aspects of <laughs> hello, uh, uh, this thing, the natural part and the extra natural part. How do you go? 
Thank you. The extra natural part and the natural part. And then also. <laughs> okay, so the two parts of a uh, man, the natural part and the extra natural part, these are all Otega. Then the the fact that man is compelled to be free, you don't choose to be free, you are compulsively free, and that is why you cannot be like the stone and all that. A critique that we raised against Otega. Uh, why man's being that's not consistent. What is that consistent? What is not yet? These are all things we had. The marathons we did in class on that should help you see why he's existentialist. He wants us to emphasize on the fact that man is able to change the status quo because he's able to make choices. Okay. So man's life is what? A project in the making, never finished, always on the on the run. Now, no, so from there. We move to um, an ethical question. We, look, we looked at what ethics is, and then questions that are called ethics, and how that differs from religious, so that we, we, we emphasize that the religious may not necessarily be ethical, and then the legal may not necessarily be ethical. All these we did, those were introductory parts of the question of ethics. Then we moved on to medical ethics. We looked at quest some questions, philosophical questions that come up in medicine or medical practice, informed consent, autonomy, ensuring beneficence, and ensuring non-maleficence. The, the steps that you have to go through, miles, energies, paper, and the contribution they make in resolving the problem if there is any. So the dilemma, the ethical dilemma is there. Would you want to respect patient autonomy because she's an autonomous being? So you are more concerned about his or her consent than benefiting, doing that which will benefit the patient. Which one would you choose over which and why? You know, that kind of discussion. If you have forgotten, I just prompted. You have questions on that also. Then from there, we move to another ethical question. And this time we focus on business ethics. We are doing ethics, but we made a question relevance connect to what business, the business setting, consequences or rule, the various types of consequentialism, then deontology, the brands, the names you know associated with these labels should be fingertips like that. If you said you've done some philosophy in the 100. You, you see that as I'm talking, you say, hey, but all these ones, I know them more. Hey, hey. And of course, Mr. Yampao, I've learned it, yeah. Just to build your confidence. All those are there. Richard, when you put your hand up and ask you to talk, then you put it down, you say, aside. Or you're having network issues. If it's a question, you're allowed to unmute and ask, okay? So we did those also. So you see the types of consequentialism, the rule utilitarianism versus Act utilitarianism, all being utilitarian views, which are a type of consequentialist theories, just like ethical egoism and altruism. They are all there. Okay, and uh, it, the critiques against them, their strength. If you are deontological, we won't normally criticize you for being overly mechanical, strict, you know, rule bound. There will be rules, rules. Are the rules just there because they are rules, ethical rules, I mean, ethical principles? There should be an end for which the rules are set which if uh, this is a specific rule is not working for, we should be able to adjust as we think or, or no. So think around it. What, what if there are conflicting ethical principles and both of them have to be obeyed, like telling a lie to save a life, you know, or it's in other words, a, a time when you have to save a life and at the same time to tell a tr the truth. They are both ethically right. And we make a demand of you to tell the truth always. At the same time, we also tell you to save a life. Human life is sacred. So if I'm caught in effects like this, how do I determine which of the ethical principles to apply? If all I'm looking at is the ethical principle, the law, the rule, like the ontology see, then I'm unable to tell which route will be because I don't have an alternative a backup to help me to check, okay, if the rules conflict, do this. You just tell me to be rule bound 
because it is important to tell the truth out. Perhaps if we added some consequences to it, then I'll say, okay, in the instance where my telling the truth will lead to so and so and so, then I should. Look. But Kant says, don't do that. Don't use human beings as a means to an end, and so on and so forth. So this, I just did some critiques with you, which are on your slides. Uh, then before even we did the um, consequentialism and the deontologism of uh, ethics, we had looked earlier at emotivism, subjectivism, objectivism, absolutism, <laughs> absolutism, absolute, yeah? uh, what is that? universalism. These are all isms that I'm sure you have revised very well, trying to show us the nature of moral standards or ethical standards. What is the nature of those standards that we subscribe to? When we say it is wrong to kill, for example, is this standard universalizable? absolute, objective, or it depends on the subject speaking, subjectivism, or the context, or the, the context you are referring to, relativism, or it is even empty of fact. It is not even stating fact at all, emotivism. If you want to say that, oh, because of the diversity of cultures, because of the relativity of cultures, therefore ethics is also relative, we tell you commit a naturalistic fallacy. All those are there because the fact that cultures are different and we eat human flesh and you don't eat human flesh doesn't in itself mean, therefore, that our eating of human flesh is right or is good. So if I see you who doesn't belong to that culture, you who don't belong to that culture, when I see you, then I, I think I've seen my daily bread, your sausage. So if you tell me as a relative is that it's okay for every culture to do what they think is right, there will be chaos because what my culture thinks is right, perhaps, perhaps may, may have dire consequences on you. If my culture thinks that we have high IQ, you people are monkeys, then you are telling me by your cultural relativism that I should do what I would do with monkeys or mosquitoes to you. So the ethical relativist is shooting himself or herself in the foot if he or she argues from the natural state of affairs to what ought to be the case, we'll be committing the naturalistic fallacy. We saw all of that. Then from there, so look at that, from introduction to, a, to metaphysical questions and then to two ethical questions. That makes five topics in all. Then we move to epistemology. Got ourselves introduced to the general framework of epistemology got to know some stuff. And I could have started with uh, Descartes immediately, but I wanted to give you space to breathe. So you just got the introduction, the channels of knowledge, the question of knowledge itself. How do we know? How do we ground our claims of knowledge? You know, And then how do we uh, justify our claims of knowledge? That's the second one. So what is knowledge itself? How do we know and how do we justify our claims of knowledge? It led us to rationalism and empiricism, what these philosophical positions mean in epistemology. Authors that are associated with each of these uh, fields, you know a priori, you know a posteriori, you know absolutism, let me say it better, absolute skepticism, um, philosophical skepticism, and you also know common sense skepticism, see that which one is sustainable, which one is not, which one is common to all. You should know this, all right. Then the last topic. So see, from topic one, two questions of metaphysics, two questions of ethics, all of them applied, you see. Then we went into epistemology proper. Then we dealt with what? Descartes, which is a the last one that I'm going to walk you through. If you added that, those are seven topics, you know. Okay. Descartes' own is what Joseph helped us remember a little. He looking for certainty. So he's distinguishing knowledge, which as he argues could be false, knowledge acquired from those two sources, okay. The rationalist sources, source, sorry, and then Paris's source. So sciences versus what? mind or reason, sensory knowledge, a posteriori, 
mind or reason knowledge called what? A priori. Descartes now says, both of these channels are not trustworthy. They are like the radio station that gave me false information about free data. I went and I was bounced. The next day they gave me the information about Kempiski free lunch. I went there, it was a, it was a bounce. So I don't trust both of them because it is prudent not to trust a source that has failed you before with certainty. If you are trusting for certain, you can't use that source. If it is just to make do, you don't have alternative. So you can work with it, beliefs, opinions, what have you. But certainty, which is what Descartes was looking for in his meditations, one and two, he cannot trust the senses for it. Why? Is he crazy? No. So he gives you several instances to show what Joseph held us to this morning. Joseph and John Woody. They said, you depend on the senses for certainty, indubitable truth. It will fail you when it comes to distant object or sight. You can't trust it. It tells you, look, it's a square. You get closer, it's rectangle. It tells you it is grandma speaking. You go there, it is grandpa. So your ears deceived you, your eyes could deceive you, etc. When it comes to distant and far objects. But what if the objects are very close? Then we cannot use the limitations of the census argument any longer. We are still doubting, trying to cast doubt on sensory knowledge. But this time, we will appeal to what the dream argument to doubt objects that are close to us and obvious. Okay. Then, so with that, the senses are the source of knowledge when we are looking for what certainty. Then he attacks the, the mind or reason as a source of knowledge. He says, that one too can't give me certainty because if I assumed, if I wanted to doubt it, I could say an evil demon is the one giving me those pure a priori truth, so to speak, so that a square is not really a four-sided figure. It should be a triangle, a triangle rather. If that is possible at all, then even what I know prior to existence, a prior, eh, can still be doubted. So he uses the evil genius's argument or evil demon's argument to doubt a prior. Right? Now the two sources of knowledge have been discredited until, as we learned, Descartes comes to himself and says, look, but think about it. In all these instances, I had to exist to be deceived. I have to be there before I can be deceived by whatever, whether it is the dream or the evil demon or the object that is far away there. In all these instances of deception, one thing is certain that I, Descartes, I am the one being deceived. And in all these instances, I have to be there. What if I am not there? He said, what if I'm not there? What if I'm, I, I'm not existing at all? Oh, I have to exist, to even doubt that I exist. Bingo, then he said, then there's one thing I know for certain, which no one can deceive me about. Even I cannot deceive myself about my own existence. Why? Because if I want to do that deception, I have to exist to be able to deceive myself that I exist. Oh, but I'm doubting things. Let me, is it possible to doubt that I exist? Well, if I'm doubting that I exist, then it rather shows that I exist because I have to exist to doubt that I exist. So then Descartes says, I have hit on truth or knowledge that is certainly true. What is that knowledge that I exist any time I think of it, any time I doubt, any time I'm deceived, any time I'm dreaming, any time I am being deceived by the external object today, supposedly. Then it tells me with confidence that I exist without any doubt, that I cannot even doubt my own existence because to doubt it, I would have to exist first. Now that is some good news for Descartes. He has established something with certainty. What is that truth? I exist anytime I think of it. Cogito, ego, so I think, therefore I am. I am here as I exist. So if I think, then it tells me then that I exist. And thinking here refers to all the states of mind, thinking, denying, affirming, doubting. I think there were seven of, of, of them all from his meditations. When he's being deceived, when he's doubting, when he's affirming, when he's denying, when he, et cetera. So those terms all represent what he calls what? Thinking. So I think mental state. Therefore, I am. I think, therefore, I am. Cogito egosum. 
Now, the, the little addition is this I that Dika says exists cannot be his body. Why? Because the body, you only know you have a body, either because you touched it, you see it, you can smell it, if it's smelly or not, like you are not bad for some days, but you can smell it or touch it. So, or taste it, you can bite yourself, stuff like that. So this is how you know you have a body, but the senses has been discredited. So what my eyes are telling me, I cannot be sure. That's why what the eye, that eye that the cat says exists. Mm -hmm. I think therefore I exist. This eye cannot be the physical body of Descartes because that is not the one that he has established with certainty. It is the thing that does the thinking, that does the doubting, that does the affirming. Whatever it is, the cat says, I'll call that thing a thinking thing. And so people label that as mind, and then that is the beginning of Descartes' epistemological buildup. Because now that he has a foundation on which to build a whole house, a very strong foundation, now everything that he threw out as not certain, they are going to have what certainty that is derived from the absolute truth he got. Their certainty is dependent on this. So it's a derived certainty. He will use that to build a whole epistemology, which I don't want to bore you with now. This is just introduction. When you advance, you'll see how he develops, the, uh, he argues for the existence of God from this. And then he will use that to build an argument to uh, uh, make a case for the existence of the external world, which he had thrown away. So he will now bring in everything, but their truth is always what? Relying on, the fact that he, the cat, is, that's the foundation. So he described as a foundationalist because he looks out for what one truth that he knows for certain, which he can use as the Archimedes point, like the compass, where you fix it, the pin of that compass, you fix it there like that, and then you draw your circle. Wherever you move the, the, the compass, you twist and turn it, a pencil will draw the circle. You are confident that the distance from the center to this, the pencil's circle will not be different from any point. Why? Because you have a fixed, solid foundation. The middle is holding. If the center cannot hold, then things will fall apart. But if you have a center that is grounded, fixed, then no matter how he hovers around in search of knowledge, he will always come back to that foundation. That is the approach he used. That's why he's described as a foundationalist, looking for one fixed certainty on which all other truths can be built on, okay? And then what is the other thing? Uh, some call him his method a geometrical method, the same thing. He looked for something that is fixed. I use the compass to show you around which he can build his knowledge. Would you think then that Descartes was an absolute skeptic? No, he wasn't. And we discussed that because he, he didn't deny, he, he didn't set off saying we cannot know anything. If we cannot know anything, why would he have been searching for knowledge? He was saying that we don't know everything for certain. That's not the same as saying we cannot know. We do not know is not the same as we cannot know. He was confident that he can know something. That's why he set off to systematically doubt in what? In search for knowledge. So he wasn't an absolute skeptic. In fact, he was even willing to admit that, look, if I search and search and search and search and I get nothing that I can know for certain, at least that would tell me one thing, which is what? That I do not know anything for certain. And that would constitute knowledge. So his posturing was more of a philosophical skeptic than an absolute skeptic. That note, I shut up. Any questions? I wish you well on Sunday. I'll pray for you. That I'll be at church. So I'll be doing my catabrewing for you so that you excel. Right after that, we launch into our last paper. And then we will munch at it. Hopefully, you get one or two other essays from there. And then we are done with the semester. Thank you very much. If you have questions, take them to tutorial. Uh, bring them to me as well. But after today's uh, when Wednesday, after Friday evening, I won't be able to respond to any query. It is not acceptable ethically, okay? Because I've set questions. So if someone sent me a question directly related to the uh, uh, content, obviously, 
and I give a response, it will be an advantage I've given to someone over someone else. That's why there's a setting like this to gather all. If one day to the lecture time, you are still dependent on the, uh, one day to the exam, you are still dependent on the lecture, it is not a good sign. So you should do your mopping up. Then those few days ahead of you will, will be a time that you are simmering what you have learned. And I'm, I'm confident I'll see a lot of 20 to about 30, 20, 29, 29, 30, 30, 30, 28. Once in a while, 17. I don't want single numbers, please. Those of you who like single numbers, not in this my eye. God be with you all until then. Take care. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, madam.